watching of uh, Breaking Bad for eight hours and then they exclaim, you know, I really want to get healthy. And, and you're thinking to yourself, um, well, and you're thinking, there's so many things I could tell you, I could, I could tell you workouts and diets and all of those things and within a week I'm sure I'd have you being a cross-fitting, gluten-hating uh, vegan and, uh, and, and, and that probably, probably going to work out just fine. Right? Pro probably not. And, and the main, main reason why is because things like that are going to happen because the person wants to try to make an attempt. Nothing that you take, nothing that you say is going to change their mind. It's going to be, they've decided they want to make a change. And the same thing can be said uh, in, in healthcare. So what today is all about is uh, is, is really about, well, first of all, I'm with Actian, we do large scale high performance analytics. And so what today is about is not about many of the things that we've talked about this week have to do with can we fix social, can we fix the, you know, the doctor, the EHR fatigue and, and uh, coordinated care. And, and there's so much to be, to be, to be worked out. Um, so I'm not going to solve all of that. Matt, can you demo how to fix all that? Seven minutes? No. Um, so we're not going to be able to demo all of the how to fix everything. We're going to stick to one focus area, and this is data. And what we really want to encourage people to do is to take that first step. Maybe put the Twinkie down or, or get off the couch or take some step. And, it, and, and if you don't get it out of the seven minutes, you come over to our, we're exhibiting, come over and we'll talk to you a little bit about it. And we'll see what, uh, what it is that we can do. Um, so. When, when you're talking to people along the lines of what they're doing in their organization, um, you hear everything, right? So in healthcare, you, you hear, it's too hard, it's, there's too much red tape, we don't have enough data, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people. Um, there's disagreements between the different groups, and some of those things are true, but the reality is if they haven't even tried, in many cases that's, that's the case, um, then there's a good chance they're not gonna finish, right? So when you think about are you going to get up off that couch or wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden be, you know, magic mic? Pro probably not. Um, you're going to have to do something about that and take that first step. And when you think about the healthcare industry, when you think about the hundreds of billions of dollars that are lost in uh, everything from fraud, waste, and abuse to preventable readmissions um, to, uh, you know, patient uh, uh, to, to any type of of aspect of your hospital, whether it's in the back off in the claim side or whether it's in the, in the, in the clinician uh, side of the business, um, there's so much data. 99% of it spills off of the table. 50% right? of the hospitals polled uh, last year had really very little to no business intelligence about what was going on. So I'm not talking about super you know, science fiction predictive, tell us what's going to happen in the future. I'm talking about basic um, an extension of the clinician or an extension of the, of the back office administrators to be able to do better than they're doing today. So it's not going to work itself out. Um, you need to really think about what you're going to do to take that first step and to start now. And again, ask a few questions. The, the objective of today will be to show you one example of many, and we can show you as many as you want, um, where you can ask a few questions, put something together, we're going to do it in whatever I have left, four minutes or left, 
uh, less and show you these are some things that you might be thinking about and we can run those along any theme depending on who, where you sit in the healthcare world and we're guaranteeing the results so it, it, what I mean by that is I can I can guarantee you that no matter what new problem you bring somebody will be able to fix that problem and make a difference in it especially if you're doing nothing today so with that I'm going to turn it over to the guy who will show you how to solve all those problems Matt. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Matt Marzillo. I'm with Slavon Consulting. We're a partner of Actian. And what we did is we wanted to develop a use case to show off Actian, do some real healthcare data, make sure the data is sizable, something that can kind of actually be impressive. Um, so we pulled Medicare claims data from healthcare.gov. We loaded it into a Hadoop cluster sitting on AWS. Um, we loaded the uh, Actian solution there, the Actian data platform, on that Hadoop cluster. And then we hooked uh, a Tableau dashboard, and then also a product called Acting Director, which is their visual interface. So it's sort of taking this abstract idea of the Duke and Big Data and making it more real that real people can use. Um, so our, our problem is trying to identify variation in terms of how much Medi how Medicare is. Um, so our, our problem is trying to identify variation in terms of how much Medi how Medicare is paying different types of providers differently for the same types of procedures, and how to do that uh, is using Acting. So high level, this is what our architecture looks like, right? So we took uh, 12 different CSV files from healthcare.gov, we loaded it on, on the clusters that we have in AWS, and then we used the Actian vector engine to connect it to the Actian director GUI and Tableau. So this is live, so hopefully it works. And this is the dashboard we created, right? So if you look at top left graph, that's, that's a measure of volume by procedure. So the high volume procedures are at top. Those of you in the front row, maybe, can see it says uh, office outpatient visit. No surprise there, that's the highest volume procedure. Um, so on and so forth. But, okay. While he's restarting it, I'll, and this is on the screen, I'll, I'll point out that um, when, you, when you look at that screen and you say, well, I don't have enough money or I don't have enough people, the Hadoop section that he got, which is the underlying data infrastructure, uh, is free. Uh, the Tableau desktop is free. At under 500 gigs, the data size from us, from Actian, if you go to Actian.com, under 500 gig data is, is free. So my point being, that it, and Amazon is rental. We can go on in five minutes and uh, and we can start up an Amazon instance. You're not buying hardware, you're not buying space, you're not buying air conditioning. You can turn it on and you can begin to pull these things together. And that's kind of some of the, is kind of some of the things that we want to point out when we say, uh, this is uh, this is possible. Quit making excuses. And I think we're out of time, but he's got about thirty more seconds. Yeah, uh, yeah. We lost. We lost. Uh, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, so anyway, so so the, the demo that I was going to show you, and we'll have it up for the rest of the day. Um, you can interact with twenty-seven million rows of data in Tableau or in the Active Director. And it's the acting data engine behind that. You can't do that normally without without a product like Actian. Acting data engine behind that. You can't do that normally without without a product like Actian. So, thanks. I'm sorry. This is going to work for us. And we have time for one question from the audience. So I'd like to have you guys be able to say something or ask a question. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. So is some of the data available on Actian website for us to play with? No, so the, the data is on healthcare.gov, uh, and if you, if you want the link to it, uh, come find me, or maybe I can talk to you afterwards, I can give you the link. It's, it's just a bunch of flat files via, via the federal government's website. Okay. That was an easy one. We have one other one. Okay. Can we have a bonus one since that was easy? Mm -hmm. What's the size of that data? So it's right around 13 gigs. 13. So, so not, not huge, not overpowering, but big enough that you can't normally hook in a Tableau uh, dashboard to it and have it run easily. And the point of the workflow, so we understand technology must be in the workflow of the, of the clinician or of the, of the administrator. And so in the demo that you can hopefully come by and see at our booth, you'll see that our report on that 13 gig, and how many rows? 27 million. 27 million rows came back in about, in about a third of a second. And so if you run the same thing on SQL Server, it comes back in about a minute and a half. So a minute and a half. 27 million rows, whatever that is. That, that, 
a minute and a half of us sitting there, the world isn't that patient. They, it should be realistic that they should be patient for someone running a career on 27. They're just not. They look at it, they get called, they get distracted, they get up, they go grab a coffee, and they come back and they've forgotten what they're trying to do. And if they're trying to bounce around and change the query, and it's taking a minute and a half every time, then your project's just failed no matter how good it is. So it's important to have the low latency or people just stop using it. All right? And please have a verse two after in the reception. Is our next speaker, Margaret Salvar, which is going to be talking about innovations and technology transfers for enhanced affordability, and we're very lucky to have you here, so thank you very much. Thank you. My last one's actually salmon, just like the fish. No, no worries. And I'm a clinician in the emergency department, and uh, none of my patients can forget that name, which is fortunate and unfortunate. Um, so I'm here with actually innovations and technology transfers for enhanced affordability. We're actually a group that was founded by Congolese uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Congolese uh, clinicians, uh, entrepreneurs from Canada, the United States, and engineers. Um, because uh, we thought we could actually solve uh, some healthcare problems um, that uh, affect some of the most marginalized populations in the world. It's actually over a billion people uh, live in areas caught in conflict. I actually specialize in the health effects uh, uh, of conflict. And uh, this organization, which actually I direct, came out of basically being in the field for eight years uh, in Eastern Congo. I just thought I would best describe this group through one of our uh, projects uh, that we did. It's on pain management. I don't know if anyone realizes, but untreated pain actually costs the world more than cardiovascular and cancer care uh, combined. There's profound psychosocial effects. There's chronic pain issues. Um, it's a real problem. And over 80% of the people in low-resourced areas uh, are not treated for pain. There's a whole host of issues uh, behind this. One is discriminatory attitudes uh, that people have, that people who are poor can actually tolerate pain. But it's also due to uh, international regulation of narcotics. Um, uh, countries like Congo that can't negotiate, uh, can't really negotiate their way through the onerous uh, regulations that both uh, uh, the United Nations and World Trade Organizations have to try to stop uh, narcotic trafficking, but ends up catching uh, countries like this. So I was sent to Democratic Republic of Congo by Harvard's Humanitarian Initiative back in 2008. And they had this thing there called the Crying Room. And it's actually quite ubiquitous all over Sub-Saharan Africa. Has anyone ever heard of a Crying Room? It's actually where all procedures happen. And since they don't have any pain management, people just basically scream their way through procedures. It's a terrible place. I was there in the middle of the war and I would walk outside the hospital compounds because I couldn't walk past that room. And then flash forward, I was actually down in Los Angeles uh, doing my internship here in the emergency department, and I saw somebody use an ultrasound. And for about two cents worth of lidocaine, they actually numbed the whole area on a person's body. And I called the surgeon uh, at Heal Africa Hospital in Goma, the big trauma center, catchment area of 25 million people, and said, hey, I think I just saw the problem of the crying room. This was a game changer. This has completely changed the way orthopedic and trauma care is done in Eastern Congo uh, on a hospital level. So Congo is pretty far away. It's right there, uh, central, uh, basically, Africa. It's got the world's uh, health uh, records in the world. It's a terrible, terrible place, but it's amazing physicians that work there and people who actually really do care. Um, I went to Goma um, because that was where I was sent in 2008. I'm quite familiar with it. But it's also the place, uh, if you want to make anything work and then prove to the world that really some of these problems can be solved cheaply, effectively, and sustainability, then you should just go to the worst. Congo experienced 6 million excess deaths in the last uh, 10 years alone. Uh, uh, due to the constant conflict and war there. Um, it's not due to traumatic injury, it's due to the absolute collapse of the healthcare system. We're now really starting to see what happened to Sierra Leone and Liberia um, when uh, they really couldn't effectively mount a response to uh, Ebola. Congo has uh, similar problems. Huge um, orthopedic center, Hill Africa Hospital, run by a, a, a surgeon who trained in Belgium. And uh, they have a huge neglected club foot center where they actually operate and try to uh, 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 transition uh, the foot. Uh, one in 500 is born with club foot uh, in Congo. <coughs> it's 
actually also called Africa's World War. So what we did is um, I got a Sono Site Fuji uh, to give us uh, several ultrasound machines. And we actually had to prove uh, that this is an effective skill that could be transferred, that it's safe for patients and machines and everything could stay secure. So I worked with uh, um, Heal Africa Hospital and uh, we're now in Ethiopia and Tanzania as well at all the large national trauma centers. And we actually uh, taught uh, the Congolese physicians uh, how to do this very simple procedure. Our cost-effective analysis shows us it's about eight cents in Congo. It's a little bit more 16 cents uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, they don't uh, call it the crying room anymore in any of the facilities that we work in. In this one hospital alone, we're 18, uh, 95 uh, procedures down. Everything's extremely well logged. 81% um, reduction in pain. Uh, we're using the uh, analog score. Uh, 1 to 12. Um, these are for things like uh, when you have to put X fixes on fractures. These are things like fasciotomies uh, where somebody has to have their leg cut open. They were either done without pain management or just some local lidocaine that uh, was injected. Uh, the feeling of empowerment uh, the physicians have when they can actually control something I think is uh, sequelae as well that can't even uh, be measured. We actually asked in all 1895, if they hadn't had this tool to be able to do, what would people have gotten? And 39%, uh, and these are bad injuries, uh, would have gotten really uh, nothing. That's actually just one of uh, the projects. Um, during this uh, time uh, that we spent there, we did this in 2011 and 2012, we realized that you can't get ultrasound gel in any remote or complex state. Uh, you can't even buy it if you had the money. And no, uh, uh, ultrasound saves lives. In obstetrics alone, this is billions of lives. So we actually canvassed uh, using human-centered uh, design methodology. Uh, we actually went into marketplaces in Mali, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Rwanda, and Congo. And we actually uh, sent research assistants to market women, showed them ultrasound gel, and said, hey, what in this market can we buy cheap, and can you make this? And it ended up to be cassava, uh, and, which is sold in uh, about 99% of the countries. And uh, uh, we published uh, maps of the entire continent uh, where hospitals can now um, uh, create a micro-financing uh, type program and have local uh, market vendors uh, actually uh, consistently supply the hospital with ultrasound gel. That actually just makes an ultrasound program even sustainable. Uh, things like that, um, we're working on some uh, point-of-care drug testing to try to bypass uh, uh, issues of bogus drugs uh, and in the adequate uh, medications that are a huge problem there. And we've taken on a, a few other projects as well. We're definitely overwhelmed. We bottleneck with just us. There's huge need out there. Um, but if we can replicate uh, us as well, I think we can actually uh, maybe empower people to solve some of their own healthcare problems or at least have a voice in it. A couple lessons that we've learned. Um, one is that people can't really come up with solutions uh, on their own when they're living in crisis. It just doesn't work. But they're great mimickers. So if you can create uh, uh, an answer uh, that's sustainable uh, with local input, uh, people can mimic that and keep systems going. There's a whole host of uh, other lessons learned uh, as well. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah? Uh, hi. <clears throat> when you mentioned the club foot situation, one in 500, why is that? Because it seems really high. And also, what is the treatment? So it's high on genetics. Um, it's actually really only been measured once, and it's by uh, the center. It actually surprised a lot of people that it's actually that high. So club foot can be solved for pennies on the dollar. When the baby's born in the first six weeks, you actually uh, rotate the foot and you simply cast it. It's called poinsettia method. That's what the rest of the world has done. Uh, here in Europe, uh, uh, they actually can sometimes fix these uh, in utero as well. Um, in Congo, unfortunately, nobody has health care, and so they end up uh, growing up with their foot rotated underneath them. It's not only extremely painful, but it's stigmatizing. These people are called witches, and they cannot live a normal life. It's not fair. Um, and so what they do is they actually uh, excise the talus. Uh, it's one of the uh, bones of the ankle, and they actually just re-rotate the foot and fuse it. 
Um, but it takes about a year of constant casting, debridement of the uh, surgical site. And uh, um, they go out in these big teams. And it was terrible. Children would run away, screaming out. It's just one of those awful things you see. And then uh, with uh, regional anesthesia, like uh, we do now, uh, people think nothing of it. I have a, a good story, though, uh, about this. Um, so uh, we actually brought a Congolese team to Ethiopia to teach Black Lion Hospital, the big national referral trauma center there, uh, how to do regional anesthesia, and, uh, which is this ultrasound uh, uh, guided uh, using lidocaine as uh, a medication to dull a nerve. Um, one of the Congolese uh, physicians heard a, a, a patient yelling and the Ethiopian orthopedist hadn't waited long enough. And I heard him uh, talking to him out of the corner of my eye that said, you know, if this ever happened in my hospital, you'd be fired. And, uh, you know, two years ago, uh, you know, people just let people yell and it was uh, no big deal. So this is a, a, a system that can be picked up uh, culturally and change behavior as well. So, uh, sorry, a follow-up to that. Go oh, ahead. so sorry. We are oh, we're running sorry. a little bit behind in time, but we can definitely follow up that question after um, No problem. Sorry. So sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Jenna Denand. I'm an international trade specialist and the Global Health IT team lead at a little-known organization called the U.S. Commercial Service. We are an economic development and trade promotion arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I'm um, going to tell you very quickly today what we do and how we might be able to help you and partner with you. Our mission is to pr promote the export of products, services, and technologies, U.S. Uh, um, products, services, and technologies overseas. Um, we promote the President's National Export Initiative. We help U.S. businesses find qualified international business partners. And uh, ultimately, we help U.S. companies uh, enter new markets uh, profitably and more quickly. We have a global network of about 1,400. We've got about 100 offices here in the US. I am based out of our San Francisco office and cover the healthcare sector and especially the health IT sector, uh, but all sectors as well. Um, overseas, we have about 130 offices and approximately 80 countries. And so our offices overseas are actually the commercial section of the US embassies and consulates. And the commercial section exists solely to support U.S. business overseas. So that means um, that these folks are our industry experts on the ground. We have American officers that rotate, and then local industry experts that are there to serve, to answer your questions, to write market research reports, and to introduce you to potential partners. Um, just a, a quick overview of some of the things we do. Um, <coughs> international sales consulting. Um, so this. You know, I like to say that my uh, best clients have me on speed dial and we try to help wherever we can in the international business process. Um, but that starts with counseling, um, you know, helping you uh, understand what the market climate looks like for, within your industry and for your particular product. Um, so that can include market research reports that are written by our industry specialists overseas. So we have healthcare reports for almost every um, country. <clears throat> and um, also you have access to our um, healthcare specialists in country that can give you direct feedback as to uh, whether or not they think that there is good potential. Um, just to give you an example, um, ever since the acronym BRIC was termed, um, referring of course to Brazil, Russia, India, China, everybody's calling me and they want to get into the BRICS, um, which of course is a, a wonderful goal. They are growing very quickly and have growing middle class and are excellent markets, but they're also extremely challenging markets. So I would never send a new young company to China, for example, unless I had previous experience there. Um, Brazil can have extremely high tariff rates. It can be almost prohibitive uh, to stay competitive and as well as very difficult regulatory, expensive regulatory um, uh, challenges in, in medical device fields. Um, so part of my job, our job, is to help educate U.S. companies as to where the best fit might be for them if they don't already know and really get that market intel. Um, let's see. Um, our, really, our bread and butter is to help U.S. companies get their foot on the ground in a new market. So um, we do a service called the Gold Key Service, which helps U.S. companies get in front of decision makers um, and meet potential distributors or companies to whom they will license their technology or in front of hospitals or governments or whoever their, um, their uh, clients are. 
Um, and so we can set up a day of appointments for companies, and this is a huge part of what we do, actually. Um, there's also an advocacy department, so any companies, uh, larger companies that are, uh, or medium-sized companies, I should say, as well, that are bidding on gov foreign government tenders, there's an advocacy department that can um, support your uh, efforts overseas in that regard. Um, and then we also um, do events. Uh, so we partner with um, major healthcare trade shows internationally and domestically um, in the health IT space. We work with HIMSS, we work with Health 2.0. Um, internationally, I'm sure you've all heard of Medica, which is the largest medical trade show in the world in Dusseldorf every year. Um, we bring our healthcare experts. Uh, last year, at, uh, just for an example, we brought 17 um, country representatives in the healthcare sector to Medica, um, which we um, around which we um, organize a program where U.S. companies can get free insight, free one-on-one -on -one appointments with these um, uh, experts to uh, discuss their market potential. Uh, we also bring delegations of foreign buyers. And then we organize smaller events such as informational webinars. So, um, um, you know, a lot of resources are out there for free or very, very nominal fee uh, for U.S. companies. I think that is the end of my uh, presentation. And I'll also mention uh, one more thing that's usually very popular is that we work with um, a number of government partners such as the Small Business Administration and the Export Import Bank that offer um, working capital loans and uh, their forms of export financing to qualified companies. Um, so this uh, could be an option for you as well if you don't have the capital but you have uh, the interest abroad and a good, a good uh, record here in the U.S. Happy to answer any questions and um, thanks for your time. We can take a question from the audience now. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> this is controversial. Sorry to put you on the spot, but the Trans Pacific Partnership is a very controversial thing. It's hundreds of pages long. We don't have access to it to really know what's there. One of the provisions has to do with uh, uh, ex extending um, uh, property rights. Uh, for, uh, for medications, so that instead of releasing it for generic production, which would bend the cost curve right. downward for healthcare in America and worldwide, yeah. uh, companies would uh, continue to be engaged and they charge $300 for a pill instead of $5 for a pill. Right. Any comment on that? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't, you know, I'm not an expert. I certainly am not privy to that document. Um, but that's one of the issues that is very controversial. And, um, you know, I, I, we do have um, some experts working on it, uh, as you can imagine, in our offices in, in D.C. So if it's something that you're super interested in, I could, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the TTIP expert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. We're moving on now to Ozzy Diaz which is Strategic Solutions Planning in Intel, and he will be presenting his The Big Data Problems with Healthcare Data. Great. Uh, to um, uh, a, 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 little, uh, a little more of a uh, tip about myself, I work in uh, the data center group within Intel um, in strategic planning. Uh, many of the business units, and so I, I, want, to, uh, I want to show you probably the most innovative healthcare cost-cutting uh, tactic I've ever seen by the TSA. So um, we're actually we're actually looking to hire uh, Mrs. Sumner's urologist and uh, work on uh, work on some innovative solutions within Intel. Uh, but uh, all kidding aside, I want to. I want to uh, transport us into what could be the future of personalized medicine. And um, there's, there's a lot of ways of getting there, but certainly one aspiration that we have, that we all have as an industry, not just Intel, is, so this is a day in the life of a patient. Um, in the morning, she's going to find out what's wrong. In the afternoon, she's going to find out what options does she have, and shortly thereafter, she's going to get an action plan with her clinicians, with her, uh, with her case managers, etc., to solve those problems. Now, it, it's, it's more straightforward from the patient's perspective. From the clinician's perspective, it's a little more complex because 
that's where uh, a lot a lot of this big data gets exposed. Um, however, a future that we're striving for is in the morning we want to get the clinician um, and and uh, their, uh, their their uh, their helpers. Um, results from uh, diagnostics, from uh, uh, tests. In the afternoon, we want to get them the results from additional uh, uh, analyses that will have been conducted, very complex analyses, bringing in uh, multivariate data sources that we can't even imagine today. And very shortly thereafter, uh, the clinician is going to have a, a personalized plan for that patient, not just picking from the available script of, you know, these are all these are all the prescriptions that are available, or these are all the treatments that are available. No, customize and personalize. Now, the road to this day in the life of is not going to be easy. Uh, in fact, we may even imagine conversations like this happening. Let's go solve this problem with all this big data that we have absolutely no clue what to do with. And and while comical, it's true because the volumes of data related to taking care of a person are unfathomable. But I want you to focus in on one particular uh, figure up there, and that is, that is this year's estimated average data to be created by an average hospital here in the US. And this is 665 terabytes this year. Now, uh, show of hands, who, who knows of the Broad Institute out in the New England area? Nobody has heard of them, a, a, a few people. Right, so Broad um, is, a, uh, is a, a top tier, very well known uh, biomedical research institution. They have a lot of partner institutions that they work closely with. Um, you know, these folks do a lot of, uh, a lot of cancer research, uh, genetics research, and so forth. Now, they're not what I would refer to as a typical hospital. But when I saw this stat, that this year, the Broad Institute is estimated to generate more data than Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon combined. So this is just one example of the magnitude and sheer volume and variety of this thing known as big data. Now, you know, at the end of the day, what are we doing about it? We're doing a lot of things about it, but the, 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 the thing that we're striving for is a faster time to outcome. Because to achieve that version of the future that I showed you there, things have to be done faster, things have to be done more economically so that they can scale and and keep pace with this big data growing problem. So this is just one example of one benchmark that uh, that we conduct regularly within Intel. And uh, these aren't these aren't the the state of the art latest greatest results because you know some of that stuff is happening in real time at Intel Labs or with our partner institutions and so forth. But for example, um, in in a 10 node Hadoop cluster to to uh, to manipulate one terabyte of data, we moved from prior generation Intel processor to a newer generation Intel processor, and we got a 50% improvement in the time to achieve that benchmark. And then made some improvements on the storage and memory, got an additional 80% improvement, and made some, uh, some modifications or changes in the networking connectivity, and on top of that, an additional 50% improvement. So uh, our objective is to take uh, a system approach because it's not just a matter of, oh, well, you know, just wait for the next greatest piece of silicon from Intel or, or new servers from HP or Dell and <coughs> problem solve. It is very much a systematic problem. And what our, our objective is to, is to focus uh, not just the technologies, but also working with uh, our partner institutions, working very closely with clinicians. And this is something that's what I refer to as the newer Intel. It, you know, it, Intel is more known as, uh, as being a, an ingredient provider. So Intel inside, you know, we've, we've heard of that brand and seen it you know, stamped on the side of boxes and our laptops and so forth. 
But I, for example, and many of my peers across the company are working directly with genome researchers uh, at Grove or at MD Anderson and so forth, working directly with software developers that are writing the, these very complex uh, medical research algorithms to make them run not one, two, five X better, more efficiently, to run a hundred X, a thousand X faster and more economic. Um, so, you know, the, our future as we want to see it is not out in, you know, the Star Trek in 2050 time frame. We want it to be something that is well within our lifetimes, not our kids or our grandkids' lifetimes. So, um, that's really it. If uh, I'm not going to be around for the networking this afternoon, unfortunately, I have to get back to Oregon. But if anyone uh, wants to continue the conversation, feel free to shoot me an email and I can take any questions right now. What's the difference between that and uh, IBM Watson's effort to basically handle data? Uh, well, I mean, I can't address what IBM Watson uh, uh, or Watson Healthcare is doing other than what they've announced publicly. Um, I would say that, you know, if you, if you got rid of the fact that it's the Intel logo up there, we're all trying to Im improve lives or help uh, healthcare providers physicians improve lives better, faster, cheaper, more accessibly, right, and so forth. You know, whether IBM gets there before we do, whether we get there before they do, or whether we all get there because it's a huge, huge global problem, I think there's more than enough pie for the rest of us. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Fred. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I worked at Kaiser for 20 years in a variety of uh, capacities and incapacities. Uh, the, the, the latest and most fulfilling was as a program director for research and innovation in clinical technologies, looking at medical devices and uh, the ways in which uh, they, they uh, affect the provision of care and the way they need to uh, be revisioned for the future. Um, the, the, this is an outgrowth of my work uh, at the Garfield Innovation Center. Uh, this, I've, uh, last month I retired, so I, nothing I say is to be uh, officially associated with Kaiser Visa Library. Um, so, uh, I want, first of all, I want to just take a note uh, of the, the sort of social ecology of our setting. We're all kind of dispersed around. Some people are listening to me, some people are checking their mail, some people are typing something, which is fine. We're all kind of very individualistically focused. And I want uh, each of you to just, this is going to be two, two quick little exercises in uh, audience participation. Uh, number one, uh, just think of any letter in, in the alphabet and when I, when I bring my uh, finger down here to 3, 2, 1, 0, uh, I just want you to say the letter that you're thinking of in the alphabet, okay? 3, 2, 1, yes. Okay, let's do that again, a little louder. 3, 2, 1, yes. Okay, now, how much sense does that make to you, okay? Uh, each of you was being innovative in a very minor way. Didn't add up to much. So what I want to do the same thing now is introduce the concept of convergent innovation, okay? So when I get to zero, you will all say together, simultaneously, convergent innovation. Three, two, one. Convergent innovation. There, okay. So we're all working with the common vocabulary, common sense of a task uh, and aspiration. So uh, this is, uh, first of all, this is delusional aspiration. I admit that right off the bat. Um, I think that we need to create uh, new kinds of uh, organizational and institutional frameworks for addressing uh, the complex challenges <clears throat> of innovation. Working at Kaiser with all the resources and talent and expertise that we had, we were still only touching part of what the potential was for improvement. So I believe that uh, innovation needs to be reorganized at a, I'm looking at uh, Latin America because I'm going to be retiring there, uh, semi-retiring, trying to create these networks that doesn't exactly constitute retirement. Um, but the idea is that the, the workload needs to be re, uh, reorganized in a way so that we're not so, uh, uh, so much defined by what I call centrifugal 
innovation. So these are just all the things that are driving uh, the need for a new model of innovation. The, the complexity is unprecedented. The pace of change is uh, unprecedented. The, the requirement for interoperability is unprecedented. You can have a brilliant innovation, but uh, you know, two years from now, there's some kind of aspect of the social climate, the culture, or the funding, or the maintenance of plans, et cetera, where even a successful innovation that's it's a point solution is very good. If it doesn't take into account, into account a much more comprehensive set of factors uh, for success, then it won't be a successful innovation. So these are values up here that I've identified. Systems life cycle vision. You have to look at the entire life cycle of innovation. You need to fit it into a sustainable development model, convergent innovation, uh, collaborative expertise as opposed to comp competitive expertise, uh, horizontal intelligence, thinking how to link expertise across departments and, and organizations, end-to-end uh, -end solution design, not waiting until you're contracting to buy something to figure out what you need. You need to work at the, at the design phase of things. Uh, pragmatic interoperability uh, and values of health for all. So I, I painfully have to zip through uh, these, um, these slides. Um, choose, let's see, one or two things. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the things I'm going to do, is, try to do, is to uh, pool together uh, expertise from the United States, uh, Japan, Europe, uh, to uh, work with ministries of health in Latin America um, to uh, share uh, experience, uh, not in any uh, didactic or, uh, you know, we've got the answer ways, uh, but to actually share some of our confusion, uh, share some of the uh, creative uh, efforts. Um, we need to have uh, a new model of uh, intellectual property, I believe. Uh, so instead of having so much innovation <coughs> driven by sole property model of IP, we would have more. We would have a combination of open source, sole property, joint property, and commonwealth property, where uh, people would commit at the beginning to maybe have their portion of the innovation be, become a commonwealth property, which would be maybe run by a foundation uh, and then uh, uh, have uh, low price licenses and royalties, etc., which would then flow back uh, to the foundation. So this is a way of combining funding. Uh, an example, sort of an example, is the Continuum Alliance <clears throat> was founded about 10 years ago by Kaiser and many others uh, to create a collaboration among people who are normally competitors in the marketplace, but they realized that the telehealth market was far too complex to solve by any of the individual players, Intel, Cisco, IBM, etc. So they all got together and identified core issues that they could work on together. And, and that, that um, uh, intellectual property would be restricted to those members for that year, and then, uh, then it would become public property. Uh, so this is the model uh, here. Uh, the idea is that each country in the, in the network uh, would become a specialist in a particular area. So my favorite example is Brazil telemedicine. They already have uh, fantastic advances in infrastructure, research, university networks, um, uh, IT systems, etc. Uh, so they're way ahead of uh, any other country in Latin America. So there's no need for Paraguay to reinvent the telemedicine uh, wheel. They can get consultation from Brazil. Brazil can consult to entire continent. Likewise with all the other issues, high altitude issues, maternal infant care, uh, mental health, uh, disaster management, traditional medicine, etc. So I've already got a variety of connections here with different institutional players, World Health Organization, American Health Organization, um, uh, Yachai University, which is established in Ecuador uh, to promote uh, high-tech solutions to uh, uh, needs, basically to transition from a, a minerals and petroleum-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. Uh, so this is uh, one of our uh, initial projects has to do with uh, heavy metal detection. Uh, there's a whole lot of work being done <clears throat> on organic microfluidic analysis uh, in lab on ship, but not so much on heavy metals. And heavy metals expose hundreds of millions of people to debilitating uh, disabilities. Uh, so this is a high priority item, uh, and basically I'm trying to put together a consortium of academic and industry and uh, public health entities uh, to address these this opportunity. This is Yachai, the university that's being created up there in the Andes. Uh, they have a whole set of academic programs, and this innovation model will cut across and integrate 
creating some of the horizontal intelligence that uh, is needed, and we hope that will then lay a basis for working with other countries in Latin America as well. Well, uh, first thing is to, to recognize that there, there is a, uh, a kind of collapse of a lot of traditional ways of doing business. I think the, a lot of the traditional institutions that, uh, that exist worldwide, whether it's the problems that the WHO had dealing with Ebola or dealing with war or disasters, uh, et cetera, there are lots of things that are encouraging people to think in different ways, to not rely on the traditional sources of authority uh, or knowledge for the solution. So more and more people, I think, are willing to be to, to experiment, to go outside the box, uh, and to be creative. Uh, that's, this this uh, taps into, hopefully, uh, people's natural ability to be uh, collaborative, uh, to, be, uh, to be hopeful, to be aspirational. And I think that once we have some examples, like the, the Happy Metal Project, I mean, if we can deliver something within a couple of years with that, that uh, touches uh, potentially hundreds of millions of people's lives, <coughs> that would be a, a link-up call, but there is uh, a, a, a good reason to pursue uh, conversion application. Well, thank you, Fred. Thank you. So um, my name is Hans Gangaspar, and I'm one of the co-founders of Nurex, as she said. First, thank you all for, for coming here to learn more about us and all these other exciting people. I know I'm last to might be a little exhausted and, and ready, ready for this to end. But Nurex is about a new approach to healthcare for people who are already healthy. So every year in the US, there are over 50,000 new HIV infections and over 1.2 million unintended pregnancies. And for the last two years, these numbers have been on the rise. And there are great solutions to, to preg unwanted pregnancies, as, as we know. Uh, the, the pill works really well, and you take it every day, and it provides excellent, excellent outcomes. What people don't know is that there is another pill that was approved in 2012 called Truvada for PrEP, that if you take it every day, it provides over 99% protection against HIV infection. But getting a prescription can be a real hassle. As, as we all know, you have to go to the doctor, and before that, you have to book the appointment and find the doctor that provides care under your plan and then you have to go to the pharmacy and get the drugs. But that's really only half the problem for these two specific drugs, because it's really awkward to go to the doctor to talk about sex. For a young girl who, who wants birth control, the, the prospect of going to a doctor and saying, I am, I am having sex and I need birth control is really intimidating, especially if if she fears that there's going to be a letter in the mailbox coming home to her parents. And now think of a young guy at risk of HIV in the South who wants to go to his doctor to talk about the risk of HIV. It, the barrier is so high, and we need to do something about that. So at Nurex, we're providing a convenient and fast solution to this problem. With us, you can come to us, and we ask you the questions that a doctor would ask in, in an initial consultation. So for birth control, we follow the CDC guidelines, we get the information, so when the doctor gets this, they hit the ground flying. We send it over from our app to one of our doctors in our network, and they can review the information, and in many cases, they can write a prescription right then and there. And if they don't have all they need, they can call, video conference, or, or ultimately refer you to someone you can see in person. When the doctor writes a prescription, we send it to one of our partner pharmacies who then rushes the drugs out with a courier. So for birth control, from, this, from the moment you open our app, you can have the drugs in hand two hours later. So it's a, it's a completely new experience and it takes away all the awkwardness of having to have this talk with the doctor. The really exciting part about this is that there's been a lot of research into how to do this and how to get the most accurate information. And we are not just faster and more convenient solution, we actually provide better care. Because when you ask women the questions that you need to ask in order to prescribe birth control, research has shown that women are much more honest when they're t 
give that information to a mobile device or to a survey than when you're sitting face to face with a doctor. And it makes perfect sense because we, we want to portray ourselves in a better light when, when we're in front of someone else. But when it's just you and the device, it's, it's all about your care. And for Truvada, for PrEP and HIV prevention, this, the same issues are there, just multiplying because the stigma is higher, it, the, the exceptionalism is higher. So we, we're not only providing faster and more convenient care, but we're providing better care. That's all I have. So, any of you have any questions? Yeah. Did you know that California just passed legislation that pharmacists in the retail settings can decide perfectly? I know the Oregon did it, uh, but it's going to the pharmacy and uh, and making this request. And in rural settings, uh, it's even more of a problem because. It's stigmatized to go and ask for this, and, and a lot of the time, a young girl's parents might know the pharmacist, and, and this this provides a, an easier way to get it. But we we really believe that oral contraceptives should be over the counter. People have been working for this for decades in the U.S. It's a safe drug. It's over the counter in more than half the world, and I think that's a great development. Oh, really quick. Uh, it's on iOS and Android. So, we're starting this as a web app because the people who need this the most have phones that aren't connected to Google Play. They use Android devices that are, are don't have the Google Play stack. So we want them to go through all the of the product of prep is that people don't take their pill every day. And that's where we have the outcomes that nobody wants. And we are working on not only ways of staying in touch with our users every day to, to encourage adherence, but on a mobile device, we can learn a lot about what people are doing, so we can we can identify those times when people are most likely to fall out of their routine and stop taking their pills. So you go on vacation, everything changes. You may be used to taking a pill every day at breakfast, and then all of a sudden breakfast is by the pool or something like that. So we can reach out to you at that point and, and work to increase it. Thank you so much. I know we have so many questions.